Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard the Wright Flyer. I'm Randy Wright, and I'll be your captain on this solo flight special edition of our state-of-the-art radio program. Folks, this will be the final boarding call, so if you please, claim your seats, fasten your seat belts, kick back, relax, and enjoy the show while I go ahead and delve into the pre-flight checklist, as there really is a lot of news and information to get to before I may fully indulge you with your in-flight entertainment. Well, folks, one of the things that we need to discuss is something that's been ailing this country for a long while now. It certainly came to the forefront when Barack Hussein Obama managed to seize control of the reins of political power in this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. And that is this, this notion of identity politics. Now, I know that we have reiterated this on previous episodes of Radio Aviation Excellence the Right Flyer, but it does bear repeating again today because of what we are facing, not just in the nation at large, but very particularly in this new movement that is threatening to take control of the gutless opposition party or GOP. And I know that I've already also dedicated several episodes to exploring the bizarre ascension of the alternative right or alt-right and have explained how they're not truly conservative in the traditional sense of the word. Because when you stop and think about it, conservative means to conserve, to attempt to preserve what was already here, not to just change things for the sake of change alone, and that is in and of itself a political philosophy and ideology. But one of the things that we have been warning about here at Radio Aviation Excellence The Right Flyer, going back to our premiere episode, which aired on September 11th of 2015, is that this dark and twisted game of semantics that's played by the left and the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media has led many people to be led astray from what true meanings of words are and to allow them to work their twisted machinations against our will. And because they make it sound benign, that makes it seem as though it's okay. But truth be told, the alt-right, which the left is attempting to paint as conservative, are not conservative because they do not value the Constitution. In fact, PJ Media had just put out a piece recently discussing how many of the founders of the so-called alt-right movement just grimaced when they discussed the fact that Thomas Jefferson had included the lines as one of the self-evident truths in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. No, they don't believe in that. They don't believe in the natural law tenets that underpin our representative Republican form of government as well as our shared United States Constitution because that is not how they identify themselves. So in other words, what the alt-right is doing is they are wholeheartedly, holistically, completely rejecting the definition of citizenship and sovereignty that is found within the clear and concise language of our United States Constitution. And folks, that should be troubling. It should be troubling because it shows now that we no longer just have to deal with the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists who are seeking to redefine sovereignty in this country, but now we also have to deal with the alt-right, which has all sorts of nefarious aspects to it and aspects to it which do not really line up with the foundational image that our founding fathers had for this nation dating back to its conception some 235 years ago. And this is part of the problem. Because when you stop and think about it, what the left is going to do is they're going to latch on to this new alternative right movement and try and lay the blame on the feet of all conservatives. It's what they've always done. It's part of labeling. And of course, that goes into the principles of propaganda as conjured up by 
Adolf Hitler's Nazi propaganda minister in Joseph Goebbels in that you want to label everything. You want to be able to attack people by projecting onto them, by freezing them, and by just attaching all of these negative things to deflect attention away from your own shortcomings, but also to vilify them. And this was also included in the frothing at the mouth Fabian Socialist Bible written by that Fabian deviant Saul Alinsky in Rules for Radicals, in that you are supposed to just attach everything to a particular person. You're just supposed to marginalize and polarize your political opponents and foes. And so we've seen that this sort of just nasty approach to politics has become the new norm in these United States of America. It's that we no longer have the ability to have civil discourse because they're doing everything in their power to polarize, divide, and conquer. And that's going to go into the deeper message of what needs to be covered today, that of identity politics. On the surface, identity politics sounds so benign. It sounds like something we shouldn't be worried about. I mean, everybody likes having an identity. We, we support identity. We love the ability that we have to shape our own view and to express our own view without fear of governmental repercussion and loss of face or encroachment by the government itself. But the fact of the matter remains that Identity politics, much like social justice, is one of those words that has been tainted by the quagmire of the dark and twisted game of semantics. And it's made even worse by the fact that it is being propagated not by your traditional Fabian socialist leftists, but by a rather young, little understood group that has started to rise to ascendancy, particularly during this fiasco of the 2016 presidential election cycle. And it ties in to this idea that they want to have a race-based identity for the United States of America. But that is not to be found within the four corners of our shared United States Constitution. And therefore, it's something that we should be very cautious about. We should be extremely and exceedingly wary of what that could do to our nation at large and to our sovereignty. Because as my first officer, Jeremy Grapenton, and I have so oft times reiterated on previous episodes, the more you think about what these people are doing, the more you come to the realization that they are trying to destroy the United States of America from within. And of course, that was one of the few things that we thought Abraham Lincoln said right when he said that America will never be obliterated by some transatlantic foe or some overseas foe. If America is to fall, it's going to be done by our own hands. In other words, we will commit national suicide from within. Now, of course, he was wanting to do that as well. That's why he had all sorts of Marxists that were friends with him and associated with him. But that that's still a poignant thing that he had said. And we do give credit where credit's due. But we see now that the various eclectic groups that compose the supposed alternative right or alt-right do not believe in the notion of the um, the American people and nation being what would be called a meritocracy, where we are all able to have equal opportunities, not equal outcomes. You see, that's what the Fabian Socialists do. They, they preach equal outcomes. They want everyone to be equally miserable. They don't want people to be able to go forth and to achieve based on their own merits, their own diligent efforts, and from their own mind and talents that were endowed to them at birth. And we see that that's a major problem because, again, it, it goes against that whole notion 
that all men are created equal. It's trying to, once again, delve into that dark and twisted game of semantics, which really should have no place in an open, honest, but above all, free society like that of the United States of America. But with the alt-right, it's worse. It's worse. They don't even believe in equal opportunity. They believe that the national identity must be reduced to race. So you have the neo-reactionaries that aren't quite as based on race as some of the other fringe elements of the alternative right, but you do have that vision. You do have that idea that we need to embrace identity politics and to pit American citizen against American citizen to fundamentally just abandon our Constitution because they believe that it's an archaic document that has no application to a fast-paced modern society like we face today, or they try and purposefully mischaracterize it due to their hatred of that sacred document as worshipping it. Because if you recall, on our last episode, we talked about Edmund Kozak that was a writer over there with Life Zets, which is Lauren or Laura Incomp's website, in which she dabbles in alternative right thinking. And it just goes to show that they have declared war on the Constitution. What's so tragic about it all is that these groups are claiming to be on the right. They're claiming to be conservatives. And, of course, the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the Salivating Mainstream Media are just extra frothing at the mouth at this opportunity to once again paint all conservatives as racist with this broad stereotypical brush that they always use and then they can go forth and say looky 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 see we've said all the time that the right in this country are nothing but a bunch of racist uh, bigots sexist homophobic people that just hate everyone and you see the alt-right wants to sit there and say that that's just us being afraid of labels but what it really is is that we understand that the dominance of which the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist left is able to exert over our mainstream information media outlets and popular culture and institutions of education means that it's going to be very hard to overcome any of these negative attributes that they are erroneously and stereotypically attempting to foist upon all of us. In other words, they're trying to make it an albatross in which they're going to hang around the neck of the conservative movement because, deep down, what the Fabian socialists have been attempting to do is to push forth with the complete eradication of a federalist, constitutionally endowed representative republic in which the government is limited and we the people are the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty. Again, that goes back to the very basis and foundation of our country, and it's why our first air marshal, Mr. Nelson Ward, has said that these people just want to promote an ideology which is a violative of the supreme law of the land. And when you look at the clear and concise language contained in the Supremacy Clause, which is found in Article 6, Clause 2 of our shared Constitution, you find that it unequivocally states that the Constitution itself composes the supreme law of the land. But when you have Edmund Kozak and these other alt-right nincompoops running out there and saying that anyone who expresses a desire to follow the supreme law of the land, any conservative who believes that the Constitution is this great beacon of liberty and freedom that has created the most open, honest, and stable form of government ever to be seen in modern society, because if you recall, it is the longest contiguous or uninterrupted running constitutional document in the entire course of human events. Well, the, the alt-right doesn't care, because for them, it needs to be separated from creed, and therefore it needs to be based on race alone. Well, that's a dangerous 
way to approach it because if you recall, the National Socialist German Workers Party was based on a type of nationalism that was based on race. Remember, Hitler was trying to secure Lebensraum or living space for the master race in Eastern Europe. Because he thought the people of Eastern Europe were subhuman, he thought it was okay for him to just go and ignore their sovereignty, ignore their borders, ignore their national history, <clears throat> and to push forth this twisted faith of Nazism, that iron and blood thing that was just crazy. They had this occult vision, particularly in the SS, when you had Heinrich Himmler trying to run around and prove that there was this old Germanic master race and that that was the way that the Reich that would last a thousand years would operate. That That's a type of faith. It's a type of faith that is very similar to what the alt-right is putting forth, at least elements of the alt-right. And that's this whole idea that the only things that matter are race, and that's the only way you have culture. That culture must be defined on race. But no, no, that is not the way that the United States has been throughout her relatively brief yet illustrious history. America is great because we understand that those natural law tenets, which by their nature are timeless, are inscribed on the hearts, souls, and minds of all of us and that we are endowed with our Creator with these fundamental and inalienable rights, and that it is the Constitution that codifies that, protects that, and allows us to enjoy and exercise those fundamental and inalienable rights. Now, the alt-right is going out into full attack mode, particularly over there at LifeZets, at Lauren, or Laura Incomp's page, because they see just as the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists see the Constitution as some sort of a block to their twisted machinations. And of course, they should see it that way, because the Constitution itself is written in such a way as to prohibit that sort of twisted machination from ever becoming a reality in these United States of America. And when you stop and think about it, that whole old adage, that notion that the United States of America is a nation of laws and not of men, ties into this notion of equal protection under the law. It is a quintessential pillar of the American identity. And the fact that these frothing at the mouth alt-right types are essentially skipping along to the same beat and tune as the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist left, leftists, it means that we, the true dyed-in-the-wool constitutional compositionists have an even greater fight on our hand, one that is going to be exceedingly difficult to overcome because we are essentially being assailed on all sides. All sides. But this race-based thing is something that they go out of their way to try and hide. They usually say that people will bark the loudest or scream the loudest when there is an exceeding element of truth to the criticisms that are being leveled against them, and they're wanting to distract attention away from that shortcoming, which could undermine and unravel their entire twisted scope and goal and ideology. And with the alt-right, you see that when they try and say, oh, only conservatives or idiots would come out and say that we are based on racism. Well, no, you have foundations in which you say particular cultures are superior to others within the United States of America. That's not the way it really works, though. It's still a type of moral relativism in that it's not based on the natural law, it's not based on the foundational image of this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. And so therefore it is a wholly alien and foreign ideology that has no place in a free society. But that's the thing. They don't care about a free society. They still want this dictatorial thing as long as it goes in line with what they have in mind. And of course, a lot of the problem as to why this alt-right mentality has been able to get such a receptive audience 
in the United States of America is a failing of the detente wing, or what's known in the common vernacular as the so-called establishment wing of the gutless opposition party, or GOP. And what it is, is that they refuse to reach out to the younger generations. They they have an inability to reach out to them, and that's due part and parcel to the fact that the frothing-at-the-mouth Fabian socialist leftists have managed to infiltrate our institutions of education. In other words, that ivory tower of academia from coast to coast and border to border to reshape the way that we're learning the history of this beloved nation and homeland of ours. And that, too, plays into the hands of these these alt-right types, because when you don't have that fluent and working knowledge and understanding of our shared United States Constitution and thereby your fundamental and inalienable God-given rights, it makes it far easier for you to, to be convinced that the entire constitutional system and representative Republican form of government we have is a failed system, one that is inherently weak because they buy into the problems of the country as as being inherently wicked or evil, as the frothing-at-the-mouth Fabian socialist leftists have always taught. But deep down, they also feel that the system that the frothing-at-the-mouth Fabian socialist leftists are pushing are diametr- or is rather diametrically opposed to their own interests because, again, it's based in identity politics. You see, that's what we have warned about on previous episodes of Radio Aviation Excellence, The Right Flyer. It's this whole notion of engaging in identity politics as a way to divide and conquer the American people. So, in a sense, when the alt-right is going out and saying these things and promoting these sorts of things that are based on a racial identity, instead of the traditional constitutional national identity that has been the historic root of the United States, they are falling into the trap of the Fabian socialist leftists. They are engaging in the act of pitting American citizen against American citizen in order to push forth their goal. And again, their goal is not in line with these, the, the overarching idea of liberty, freedom, justice, and true equality. Meaning, again, equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. But when they have decided that the Constitution is just some fuddy-duddy thing that has no place in a modern society, they are engaging in the same course of destructive behavior, the same course of dilettantic sort of thinking that really places the United States of America in a precarious position. Remember, folks, what's so important about the Constitution is not only does it outline the proper scope and application of government, but it mandates it as well. It also codifies our fundamental and inalienable rights, which George Mason had concluded during the time that he was called upon to help draft the Declaration of Rights for the state of Virginia that ultimately became the basis of the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to our Constitution, that these rights were endowed to us by our Creator, the God of nature. In other words, no legitimate or earthly or rightful authority could abridge those rights, encroach upon those rights, take away those rights without due process under the law. You see, the whole system is designed to protect the ability for us to have individual ideologies, individual identities. But you see, the the alt-right, just like the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists are collectivists at heart. They do not believe in this idea that self-accountability, self-responsibility ultimately works together to create self-determination and that those are the fundamental pillars of stability of this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. So we've We see, again, that this 2016 election cycle has brought this sort of madness to the surface. It means that we are in a fight for the very soul of our nation. And when I say the soul of our nation, I am speaking specifically to our sovereignty. 
When you go back and look at the opening lines to the preamble to our shared United States Constitution, you see that it opens with the iconic words, we the people of the United States of America. That means that the authority for the rightful and legitimate power of government in these United States of America was delegated unto the government by the people. That means that the people are the ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty and that the federal government is one that is supposed to be limited in scope and application. But the problem with the alt-right is that they are being tied in line with, with a different type of nationalism that is not based on the national identity of the United States of America. What defines the national identity of the United States of America is the very document that they have come out in such staunch and stark opposition to. And of course, that is none other than our shared United States Constitution. And therefore, they are opposed to the natural law, which is the very credo of our nation. It's what has propelled our nation to such lofty heights in our relatively brief yet illustrious history in the course of human events. But the alt-right doesn't see it that way. They see it as that is what has allowed people to pervert the system and that it in and of itself is a perverted ideology, a wicked one. And in other words, they're turning to the type of prototype that was used to create the basis of the several fascist systems that arose in Europe during the 1930s and ultimately led to the outbreak of the Second World War. And of course, that's an exceedingly dangerous position to accept because that led to such horrific bloodshed and led to a long, drawn-out war where millions of people died. These sorts of ideologies rightfully should have been left in the rubbish bin of history, but we find that in these times of turbulence, which has clearly been brought about by the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists, that these radical ideologies that have no basis in the history of the United States, or more importantly, in the philosophy of the United States, begin to rear their ugly head again because people are feeling desperate. And nowhere is that more clearly felt than in the younger generation, where they have been fed all of this propagandistic filth by the historical revisionists, by common core education, all of these things which are designed to, to eliminate or eradicate this fundamental and fluent understanding of our national character, heritage, spirit, but above all, identity. So you see, they begin to fall back on tribalism. They want to promote tribalism because they think that that is the only way that the nation thrives or can flourish. But nothing could be further from the truth. There is a type of tribalism in true nationalism, and nationalism per se, or in and of itself, is not inherently a bad thing, but it becomes a bad thing when it is used to go against the natural law, the very foundation of our representative Republican form of government. That is the dangerous and untenable situation that has been exposed and brought to the forefront all throughout this 2016 presidential election cycle. Donald J. Trump has reached out to this group. Now, I know there are some people who believe that the alt-right really doesn't have as much of an impact as the media is trying to make it, and they're, they're perfectly correct in, in, in this distrust of the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media, because since the time of William Randolph Hearst and that conglomerate of newspapers that he had at the 20th century, turn of the 20th century, in which he, he created yellow journalism, that, that is a logical position to take when they've been lying like they have, when they've been sensationalizing the news, when they have been going forth with a particular bias that shapes and colors the news instead of objectively reporting it, while at the same time 
coloring themselves in the veneer and the claim that they are just objectively reciting the facts... Remember that Walter Cronkite had said at every closing of his show, that's, and now you know how it is. That's just the way it is. Or though, that's how it is. But that's not how it was. He was editorializing. He was putting a spin to it. And we see that today at an even more alarming rate by the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the Salivating Mainstream Media. But the alt-right is still there. The alt-right still is having an impact for that, and a clear sign that Trump is at the very least attempting to reach out to them can be seen in the fact of Trump hiring Stephen K. Bannon from Trump Bart, I mean Breitbart News, to be the CEO of his campaign, whatever the hell that means. How can... What is the chief executive officer of a campaign? It's not a company. Again, this goes back to one of the lines that my first officer... Jeremy Grapenton and I have reiterated on previous episodes of Radio Aviation Excellence, the right flyer, which is this, that the United States of America cannot be run as a business, not when you have our fundamental and inalienable God-given rights hanging in the balance, not when our sovereignty is in, in the, the, the balance here, because those things are more important than business. Those things are inherent. Those things are attached to the natural law tenets, which by their nature are timeless. So the entire impetus of what our founding fathers had, had done during the Constitutional Convention and during the early beginnings of this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours is just as applicable today as it was then, as God willing it will be centuries from now. But of course, with that is this idea that every liberty and freedom is couched with a duty, obligation, but above all, a responsibility. And when it comes to our fundamental and inalienable God-given rights, that duty, obligation, and responsibility is to proactively maintain and safeguard those rights from all people who are attempting to strip, deprive, encroach, and abridge those rights. That's why the governmental officers are all expected to swear an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. But we see that there is a strain now on left and right in this country that is moving against that notion, that is attempting to strip and deprive us of that to engage in race-based politics. Again, that's the danger of identity politics. While it sounds so benign on the surface, you see that it is really just a tactic, a ploy designed to pit American citizen against American citizen in order to achieve the ends of weakening the societal fabric of these United States of America to bring about the fundamental, permanent, and irreparable transformation of the United States of America away from a constitutionally endowed federalist representative Republican form of government into some twisted, either race-based national identity or Fabian socialist-based dystopia. Either way, none of it is in line with what has made us such a robust and powerful nation in our relatively brief yet illustrious history. Now, that's not an easy thing to hear. It's not something we enjoy hearing because it shows that there is a fundamental undercurrent that has created a massive problem that shows no signs of improving at any time within the foreseeable future. But we have to face this, because this identity crisis, which is coupled with a slew of constitutional crises brought about by our federal government, just further distancing and divorcing itself from the clear and concise language contained within the four corners of our shared United States Constitution, we are being pushed to the breaking point. We are at the brink. We are in a precarious position, and the alt-right fits into that, the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftist fit into that, and maybe the alt-right doesn't think that they are going to be playing along with the Fabian Socialists. Maybe they think that it's some different system 
that they can differentiate or distinguish themselves from the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists or that they are somehow opposed to them. But truth be told, they're not. They're playing right into the hands of the Fabian socialists who have been at this a lot longer than the alleged alt or alternative right has been. And that's the dangerous game of deception that is unfurling before our very eyes. Because the frothing at the mouth, Fabian socialist leftists see this as the perfect opportunity to once again double down on their efforts to tear this nation apart at the seams, to redefine who we are. But we can't allow that. Because it is not who we are. It is not in line with our national heritage, character, spirit, and identity. But when you don't know what that identity is, when you don't know what the quintessential nature of being an American citizen endowed with those fundamental and inalienable God-given rights are, or worse still, you believe that those fundamental and inalienable rights aren't God-given, but are government-given, that's when you start to fall into the traps of these reckless ideologies that truly do not have a place in an open, honest, but above all free society like that of the United States. And we see that identity politics has been used by other nefarious groups, groups that I would even go so far as to call domestic terrorist organizations. Look at the Black Lives Matters organization and all of the tumult and chaos and turmoil that they have spread throughout the United States of America by whipping up these riots, by pitting American citizen against American citizen, all based on an erroneous notion of Identity politics. Folks, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the only identity politics that should matter in the United States of America is the identity that is contained within the Constitution. That is our identity as the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty in this nation. That's it. That is what defines us as a nation and as a people. That tells us what the role of nation and people are, and the roles that are to be played out in their symbiotic relationship. That's why it's a social compact or contract. In fact, it is the greatest social compact or contract ever devised by the hands of men, yet divinely inspired by providence above. But again, this message is not being conveyed by the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the Salivating Mainstream Media. It's not being conveyed by the historical revisionists or within Common Core education. No, this now falls on our shoulders as the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty in these United States of America to come forth and to grab the baton and to move forward with ensuring that the identity of our nation and the fluent and working knowledge and understanding of our Constitution and thereby our fundamental and inalienable God-given rights can be handed down to posterity so that it can be exercised with even greater ease by those up-and-coming generations and indeed even those generations which have yet to be born to, to even a greater extent than we were able to. Now, I know that it's far easier to say this and to speak about this than it is to actually go forth and move forward with what we have dubbed here at Radio Aviation Excellence the Right Flyer as the Constitutional Compositionist Movement. But we have to do it because as the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty in the United States of America, we are the only ones endowed with the legitimate and rightful authority to go about accomplishing this. Because if you stop and think about it, folks, the government belongs to you. The Constitution belongs to you. Your rights belong to you. But you can't recklessly use your rights. You can't go out and abuse your rights to where it encringes, or I mean infringes or encroaches upon or abridges the fundamental and inalienable rights of your fellow popular sovereigns. That's why we have the criminal justice program and system. That's why we have laws. That's why a government, though it must be exceedingly limited in scope, is necessary. Otherwise, you have this sort of tribalism that has been the root of the alt-right. And the truth of the matter is, both the extreme fringes of the left and the right are embracing identity politics. But 
for different goals and different groups. But ultimately, it still comes down to being against the natural law tenets that form the bedrock foundation, not only of our shared United States Constitution, but also of our constitutionally endowed Federalist Representative Republic. And therefore, it should be wholeheartedly rejected. We should not embrace these groups. And you can see that the alt-right, especially being led by the standard bearer there with Stephen K. Bannon, are doing everything in their power to push traditional constitutionalists out of the gutless opposition party or GOP. That's part of their twisted machinations. The Democrat Party was the first to do it. They are following the model of the frothing at the mouth baby and socialist leftists who were able to do that within the Democratic Party some decades ago. You don't see the Zell Millers anymore. You don't see conservative Democrats anymore because they have no place in it because that party has slid so far to the left. And society has pushed further to the left with the type of moral decay and degradation that has become a new norm in the United States that it, it, it's to the point now where the gutless opposition party or GOP is starting to slide to the left to a position that cannot be accepted, to a position that should be raising the red flags for decent, hard-working, red-blooded American citizens all throughout this nation because, again, we're falling into the trap of the game they want to play. And that game will ultimately tear us apart, both as a nation and as a people. It will eradicate our national heritage, character, and identity. But why? Why is it that in 2016, of all times, we find that this has gripped the nation in a way that it hasn't in living memory. Well, the reason for that is because of the heightened sense of just alarm, this heightened sense of desperation that has been allowed to overcome this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours because of the failings of the gutless opposition party, or GOP, to stand up to the extra-constitutional activities of the Chiquita-in-Chief, President Peel and Squeal himself, Barack Hussein Obama. So here we are. We find that Identity politics, the politics of division, has been allowed to go forth. We see the ascendancy of these cultural Marxist domestic terrorist organizations like the Black Lives Matters organization rise up to fruition, and that fuels the fire of the alt-right that wants to see a different type of socialism, a different type of collectivism take root in the United States of America, and they see the Constitution as a great hurdle and obstacle. And so, much like how Adolf Hitler had signed a non-aggression pact with Joseph Stalin during World War II before he engaged in Operation Barbarossa, it's the alt-right looking at the frothing at the mouth, baby and socialist leftists, and saying, look, in this instance, with respect to the Constitution, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so they see the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists as being an enemy of we who are an enemy to them, and therefore they are joining forces to attack the Constitution. And that's why you see people like Edmund Kozak over there at LifeZids um, just writing that garbage, going forth and proclaiming that those of us who are standing up for the preservation and the promotion of the United States Constitution are a bunch of idiots, fools, for placing our faith in that. But then he, he conveniently ignores the entire fact that he is the one that is going out and engaging in a cult of personality, placing all of his faith not even in a document that is based on natural law tenets which are permanent, which are, are timeless, but in a finite man, a flawed man, a man who has a totalitarian streak in him, who is just already abandoning the, the, the principles or so-called principles and promises that he made throughout the most heated and contentious primary process of living memory. No, that doesn't cross his mind because, again, he's got an agenda. 
They're playing out of the propagandistic handbook, but they don't realize that they're being played by the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists. The, the Fabians have been doing this, folks, for well over a century and a half now. And therefore, the alt-right is essentially a bunch of political neophytes going against battle-hardened, battle-scarred deviants who also wish to drastically, fundamentally, and irreparably transform the United States of America away from that representative republic that is the longest contiguous running one in the course of human events in all of world history with this failed system of Fabianism. Because let's face it, folks, everywhere that, that socialism has been tried, it ultimately fails. That it is theft by any other name, that it is not based on the natural order of things, and therefore really should have no place in an open and honest and free society. So here we are. We find that the forces of tyranny, despotism, and ultimately oppression are forming a cabal to try and trample upon our shared United States Constitution, thereby taking away our fundamental and inalienable God-given rights to force us into this system that's untenable and unacceptable. Why would we agree to this? The truth of the matter is we shouldn't agree to it. The truth of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, it works against us. It tears us apart and it allows other nefarious elements to come forth and work against the United States of America as well. Re recall that we warned you of Alex, uh, Alexis Dugan over there in Russia, who is nothing short of a fascist himself. He is helping to stoke the flames in this untenable situation as well, because he sees this as an opportunity to push fascism in the land of the free. And that cannot be allowed to, to happen either. And folks, y you see that this has led to another problem as well. Think about all of the hoopla that's going on right now with the San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick. Now, he went out and said that he was going to refuse to stand for the national anthem because he refused to give any allegiance or support to a nation that oppresses black people or people of color. Again, this is, once again, identity politics at play, being put into the public eye, being used to divide and conquer. And you see that he's essentially going out and saying that when... He's exceedingly wealthy. He's managed to make a lot of things. He has used our freedoms to propel himself to such lofty heights. But then he goes along with this Fabian narrative that the United States of America is an inherently racist country. Because if you recall, Obama went out and said that racism, systemic racism, is an inherent part of the DNA of the United States. It's just not true. It's just not true. But they buy into this nonsense. And of course, that pours fuel on the fire for the alt-right, the alternative right that is just going forth, marching forth, goose-stepping forward to try and dismantle the Constitution and to force this nation into a precarious position which it should never be placed in. So again, identity politics has become a central thread that has been haunting this nation ever since Barack Hussein Obama first wielded the reins of political power here back in January of 2009. You know, think back to the time when he, he criticized the Massachusetts police uh, or the police of that town where his professor friend was essentially breaking into his own home. Remember, he went out and he said that the police acted stupidly in response to that. Again, that was all part of this push for identity politics. It was all part of this notion of attempting to redefine the United States of America as a nation and as a people, to pull us away from being that representative republic that is truly a meritocracy in which we are able to build upon uh, our own gifts to make something of ourselves through equal opportunity, not equal outcomes, to, to change it to this frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist dystopia. That is truly unacceptable.
It's unacceptable because it goes against all of those inherent aspects of our nation that defines us, that has defined us for 235 plus years. So you see, they are deliberately moving against the traditions and institutions of the United States in an attempt to redefine us and to reshape us, to make us susceptible to the chicanery that they are trying to cram down our throats and against our will. But it ultimately shows us that the extreme fringes of these movements that are not based in the natural law tenets that form the bedrock foundation of our Constitution and our Republic are essentially touching, coming together, although in opposite ways, to a similar type of mindset. Because we've already seen that there are community colleges out there that want to offer black studies or whatever sort of race-based studies only to those groups. That is a re-establishment of separate but equal. That is throwing out Brown v. Board of Education and trying to return to Plessy v. Ferguson. And it's the same type of logic and mentality, but argued for different reasons, that is being espoused by the great majority of the alternative right or alt-right. Now, I'm not trying to say that all elements of the alt-right are race-based. It's just that that aspect of them, that that constituency of them, or facet of them, is the loudest. Because it's going to get the most attention from the... um from the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media. And it, it, it cannot be accepted because it goes against who we are. It goes against the grain and fiber of this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. So we as a nation and as a people must reject this because what they are doing is trying to push us ever further leftwards trying to, again, get us to distance ourselves and divorce ourselves from the Constitution. And when we do that, then we are beginning to unravel who we are as a nation and as a people. We're going against our traditions and our institutions in a way that is shaping us to be something diametrically opposed to all that we hold near and dear, something that we fought against during the Second World War. We don't want to become the very thing that destabilized the globe and the very thing that our grandparents, or in some cases great-grandparents, or in some cases parents, went out and fought against, risked everything to fight. Because as soon as we do that, then we have betrayed our principles. We have betrayed our history. And we have gone down a dark path that it will be nigh impossible to return from. But what makes all of this so dangerous is, if you recall, the the Democrats have always tried to make this about identity politics before Trump even got into the race. Trump essentially fulfills all of the stereotypical, two-dimensional caricatures that the left has attempted to pigeonhole the right with for election cycle after election cycle for nearly a half century now. And they're ramping up that, that nonsense because they saw how much leverage they were able to get out of it throughout the disastrous two terms of this Barack Hussein Obama regime. And so again, it requires that we have a well thought out response to it because that is the only way that we can bring this nation back to the path to prosperity. But that means that we have to be able to communicate it. And of course, I know that that is far easier said than done because of the way that the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media has gone out and suppressed coverage of those of us who are like-minded and of the type of movement that we are trying to, to bring forth. Again, that's why we here at Radio Aviation Excellence the Right Flyer have come forth and 
produce these shows for you. The entire purpose is to empower you, is to make you aware of these threats that are facing you, but also to give you practicable, real-world solutions to these problems that are facing us both as a nation and as a people. And the way to overcome the major hurdle and obstacle that we are facing right now, as I sit here and speak into this microphone, the danger that is posed and presented by the so-called alternative right and their embracing of identity politics in conjunction with the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftist use of divide and conquer is to go back to basics. I know we have reiterated that time and time again on previous episodes, but it is on point and it matters because that is how you get back to dealing with these problems. The solutions are found in the key and the key has been with us since the inception of our nation some 235 plus years ago. And that key is none other than our shared United States Constitution. We find the solutions within the clear and concise language of it. The way to really put the United States of America back onto the path to prosperity is not to engage in the big government nonsense and crap that has been foisted upon us by Donald J. Trump. No, it is to go back to strict adherence to the clear and concise language within the Constitution. Not to create some bastardized New Age interpretation of it, because as we have oft times reiterated on previous episodes, the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution specifically prohibits that and forbids it. Because the interpretation was there at the time of its writing. Because it's based on those natural law tenets which are by their nature timeless. Just as applicable today as they always have been and as God willing they always will be. But that's the thing. We have the dark and twisted game of semantics going forth again, driving people away from the clear and resolute understanding of what those rights are and what our system of government is, to have them essentially wandering around as though they are lost. Because, in a sense, they truly are lost. That is what the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists, and indeed now the neophytes in the so-called alternative right or alt-right, are pushing for. They want disillusionment. And that is part of what has made Trump so attractive to a great many of the disillusioned conservatives. It's what led us here at Radio Aviation Excellence, the right flyer, to dub him the Pied Piper of disillusioned conservatives. It's because of the failings of the gutless opposition parties to Taunt Wing, or the so-called establishment wing of the Republican Party, that has led people to become so disenfranchised that they don't see the alternative right or alt-right influence that is taking grips and control within the Trump train. You see, by turning to Stephen K. Bannon, Trump is essentially embracing all of this. By turning to him. He's also giving them credibility, something that they lacked before because they were kind of just this loose-knit internet troll farm, for lack of a better term. And so now they see that this is their opportunity to set foot into the mainstay of the arena of American politics. And that cannot be tolerated because it will fall perfectly into the trap that the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists have set for conservatives, but not just conservatives, for constitutionalists, because they will paint us with that broad brush that that basically throws the alt-right as an albatross around our neck and attacks all that we hold near and dear in this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. It means... Ultimately, that we are in a very dangerous spot because when they go so far as to have the up and coming generations not know who they are, to not know how their rights came about or exactly what type of government they have, it leads those that, that see that there's an inherent problem with the message that's being foisted upon them by 
the historical revisionists and the common core types and the the left-wing professors as wrong and being pitted against them and not in their best interests. And so then they start to wonder as to whether the alt-right is correct in saying that any type of representative government of its own nature is weak, of its own nature just works against their best interests. You see, that is the way that Adolf Hitler was able to take control away from the Weimar Republic in Germany during the 1930s. He essentially pointed out to the representative form of government and said that, look, the Reichstag is not representing you. It's weak. It's unable to cope with the Great Depression. And therefore, you need strong leadership brought through him. In fact, his whole thing was, quote unquote, strength through joy. In fact, that's what he originally called the Volkswagen Beetle, the people's car. It was the Kedestadt, or the city of the, the strength through joy. Strength through joy. Or was it joy through strength? You see, he was playing around with the words there. It was one of those propaganda goals and, and, and gems that, that Goebbels had created, and Hitler saw this as the perfect opportunity to try and redefine Germany. And they did. They redefined it, and they used the youth to help propel them to it. They used disillusioned laborers to do it. And we see that Trump has even gone out and, and said that he wants to redefine the Republican Party as a workers' party. Well, recall again that Nazi was an acronym for the National Socialist German Workers' Party. So you see, these strains of fascism are being used with a new politically correct title, that of alternative right. That's all the alt-right is being labeled as, and each and every element of them, as you can hear on the special that I had that was directly focusing on the impact that the alt-right has had on the 2016 election cycle it has been about just creating superiority, thinking that there is an inferior group within society. All of this tribalism based on strong centralized government that really does not have a place in an open, honest, and free society like that of the United States of America. And so you see, we do have our work cut out for ourselves, and we will have to overcome these problems that have been foisted upon us. But if there is any people on the face of God's green earth that will be capable of doing that, it is the American people. It is because we have that indomitable and unconquerable spirit that has been a quintessential part of our nature and our character going back to the inception of this nation 235 years ago. And we will overcome these hurdles and obstacles because there really is no choice. We are the last best hope for freedom in this world. We are the last bastion of liberty in this world. And we are the only ones endowed with the authority, the responsibility, and the wherewithal to literally save this country. We're the only ones that can, in our capacity as the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty. That is how it must be. And with that said, it is time for us to begin our descent. I'm going to go ahead and send the flight attendant back for one last round of alcohol. As always, folks, I'm Randy Wright. I've been your captain, and I want to thank you for choosing to fly the Wright Flyer, and I invite you to leave any questions, comments, or concerns you may have either here on our YouTube page or Facebook page. And on top of that, I invite you to follow us on Twitter with the Twitter handle at RadioAviationEX. One more time, folks, that's at RadioAviationEX. And there you will find the departure board that lists my personal Twitter account, the personal Twitter account of my first officer, Jeremy Grapenton, our blogspot uh, account, which has audio blogs and the new audio-only format of our state-of-the-art radio program, and, of course, the Cafe Press account that has all sorts of trinkets and goodies from clothing, attire, apparel, all with our original logo on it or our first-class passenger logo, and all at reasonable prices. Go ahead and take a look at that, folks, and uh, give us a bit of support. We really do appreciate it because we do these programs for you. As always, I want to thank you again for choosing to fly the right flyer. We'll see you again next time. Do take 